some people are like, oh my God, he's a communist. Oh, he's a socialist. <laughs> you know, Obama's a socialist. And it's like, well, socialists and communists, they don't bother me that much. You know, I'm not that worried about them. Because? Because I think that the, dis- the thing that makes it bad is whether it's forced. And I think that sure. communism and socialism can both happen on a voluntary scale, on a right. voluntary basis, just like capitalism. If capitalism is forced, bad. If it's voluntary, cool. It's cool with me. Today is Wednesday, August 28th, 2013. I'm here with John Tyner, the terror of the TSA, and I'm George Dudley. Today we're talking about how big car corporations are trying to shut down a better car, about a former general who announced some pre-planned wars, about the Ron Paul channel haters, and uh, we're taking a question from listener Roger, who worries that I'm becoming a communist. And finally, our main segment tonight is about Syria and war in a stateless society. So welcome to the show and enjoy our temporary Liberty Autonomous Zone between your ears. <laughs> How are you this evening, John? I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm feeling good. Feeling pumped. How come you didn't give yourself a cool nickname there? Yeah, I, don't, I didn't. It seemed too self-indulgent. And I'm going to have to work on something <laughs> for next week for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because for those of our listeners who aren't aware, John uh, is back in 2010, was it? Yeah, November. Yeah, 2010. Yeah, you uh, went through a TSA checkpoint, and you were like, "Don't touch my junk," right? Yeah, I tried. I tried to go through. They wouldn't let me. Of course, yeah. they they tell it differently. They say I refuse to go. Uh, yeah, you were like going on a hunting trip, right? Yeah, I was trying to. Yeah, actually, I'm scheduled to go on another one in a couple months here. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I've been groped a few times now going through the airport. So, I mean, it seems like there's not a whole lot I can do about it if I actually want to go hunting. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, so our first topic for this evening is uh, Tesla. The uh, Have you heard of Tesla, John? I have heard of Tesla. I actually uh, invested in them on the day they IPO'd. Oh, really? And I sold out, sold out of it that same day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're a market speculator. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Doug Robert Baron, <laughs> character uh, from a previous episode. Right, right. What what was it? Doug Robert Baron is looking to to get up on the latest fashion with was it? Oh, with the new monocle, right? Yeah, the new monocle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I came across this article on GigaOM about how uh, Tesla in California, it, their only car now is a is a luxury model, but how they're outselling like. Most of the other uh, luxury model cars, even gas cars, in like California. Like Lexus and those kind of ones? Or, yeah. Or like Mercedes and BMW even? Well, it says specifically that it's beating out both the Audi A6 and the Lexus GS. Nice. Yeah. And uh, the sales of all the other luxury cars like Mercedes and BMW are down this yeah. year. And that the Model S accounts for 50% of electric car registrations in California in the first half of the year. Really? Yeah. And, that, and that's the, their luxury version. They're planning to come out with a, uh, like a, a, a cheaper car. You know? Do you know what they're charging for this thing? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I thought the article I had said, I mean, I don't know if it's the same model you're talking about, but I thought they were talking like around $35,000 or something like that. Wow. That's pretty so. cheap. Yeah, I mean, it is, but then, I mean, they've also got, like, a federal subsidy of, like, 7500 bucks too. Oh, really? So, yeah, but one of the articles I was reading was talking about that. So, yeah, I mean, I guess by the time you compare it to, like, a Lexus or an Audi, you know, Audi and those are ones that are probably a similar price without the subsidy. Hmm. So, I mean, I know they, they typically charge, you know, upwards of forty grand. So, if you can't get 7500 back, then, yeah, the electric car looks a lot better, especially, you know, you don't have to look at the, you don't have to get the uh, pay for gas anymore. Yeah, so I, you're out in California. So is the electricity free for these cars, or or do you pay for that you, too? I don't know how. I mean, I assume you plug it in at home. Um, I don't know what kind of power they draw, but I imagine plugging into the wall is cheaper than buying gas. Hmm. Right now, I think here it's about three seventy a gallon. I think is what I paid the other day. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what a kilowatt hour goes for though, but I think it's significantly less than that. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like, I don't know the specs, like how much power these things draw or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I heard something about how they're going to have charging stations. 
But, yeah, uh, those might be free. Like if you pull up to a charging station, like with hybrids and stuff, like I've seen those and you just pull up and plug in and I assume, I assume the state's paying for those, but I don't know. Hmm. So it's free to you and I guess not free to the taxpayers. <laughs> yeah, here I was hoping Tesla was, was going to be a good example of like, you know, the free market in action or something, but... Yeah, I so saw like when you originally proposed this topic, I just read an article the other day that they just paid back some huge loan that the government had gave them. Oh, really? Yeah, back in 2009, I think the government lent them 400 and almost half a bill or half a half a billion dollars, yeah. Wow. So I mean, they paid it back in like 4 years and I guess all the other major car companies also got similar loans. I don't know if they're similar amounts or not. Um, but none of the rest of them have paid them back yet. Well, but yeah, yeah Tesla's at least earning enough money to pay their loan back. Well, those those big car companies they still owe from like uh, from those bailouts in two thousand and eight or, or with right the, cri- the with the crisis yeah, they're, right they're never going to pay that stuff back <laughs> they're permanently on the dole yeah exactly so I came across this video about how uh, their ban so Tesla wants to sell their cars direct to the consumer and no right. haggling and all that stuff right yeah so, I saw that that was kind of interesting basically you don't get to haggle that you pay what they tell you. Yeah, and no commissions for the salespeople. Right. And so in, in Texas, they they have this thing that just boggles the mind. They have franchise laws that are, you like you can't sell cars unless you do it through a dealership. Yeah, I think I heard about something like this in North Carolina or somewhere too. Yeah, and so Tesla is basically locked out of the state because they don't want to go through the, the franchise thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I assume the franchise, I mean, they're a middleman. I assume they're just going to increase, you know, they're going to increase the cost of the car somehow. I mean, they tack on their fees and then sell the car. So, well, and they fund yeah. the, the, the politicians at the, at the local level. I, I, right. I, yeah. I mean, that's how it works, right? When you can't compete, you get the government to slant the market in your favor. Yeah. And in the video, the, the guy who was, who was saying, you know, that he was like the, the spin done by the status people and the corporations is so good. He was saying, "Well, no, it's it, it's it's just that that Elon Musk, you know, the CEO of of Tesla, he he wants an exception to the rules that everybody else plays by. Well, right. Everybody has to abide by the franchise rules, you know. He's the one who wants to do it his own way, you know. Right? Yeah, it's such a good spin, you know. Yeah, I know. I can't believe the reporter didn't get on his case and be like, "Look, this guy wants to sell it cheaper. Like you're tacking on fees, you know." Yeah. If we cut out the middleman, the price goes down. Yeah, the, the question never comes up like, well, why is the government even involved in deciding how cars are sold, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, the guy also spun it as, I guess it's a better deal for Tesla too. You know, like I guess, I guess the argument is they make the same amount of money without doing the work. Like they don't have to provide the salespeople or something. Hmm. But so, then you know, it screws Tesla, the consumer. Tesla makes the, right, but it screws the consumer, right, exactly. Yeah. Tesla makes more money, the same amount of money probably in the worst case. But yeah, the consumer has to pay some more. Yeah, yeah, but nobody ever thinks about that or brings that up. I didn't. I didn't get it. The cons- Yeah, the consumer. No, he'll be fine. Yeah. No, no, no. They're trying to protect the consumer. Right, right, right. But <laughs> yeah, you can't have you can't have these franchise people on the one side selling it, and then this other guy selling it differently. Everybody has to do it the same. Yeah, we have to make sure the people who sell cars are qualified to do it. Right. They have yeah, to get a, be, yeah. a special license, and they have to be inspected. <laughs> there right? you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, good for him. I mean, it's they're they're cool looking cars. I see him driving around out here every once in a while. They're cool looking cars. So I mean, if people are willing to pay thirty grand for them. You know, more power to them. But yeah, it certainly would have been nice if he had. You know, he hadn't built his business on you know the back of the taxpayer and a subsidized federal loan. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it, you know, and I think a, a skeptical listener might be thinking, well, you know, how else could he have done it, right? Like, what if, what if he had been he had taken the the hard libertarian position and been like. Well, I'm not taking any money from the government, you know, but the, and then he goes to banks and whatnot and nobody wants to give him money. You know, like, I don't know if you've seen that movie, uh, I think it's called Tucker. You know that mm. movie? No. It's about how a guy, like, after World War II comes back and he builds this really excellent car and, well, it, it's got a, it's got a, its own, like, vaporware kind of a thing going on but he builds this really excellent car and then big detroit the big car manufacturers basically shut him out of his out of a place to produce it out of financing everything they shut down everything and he has to go out of business 
Yeah, I don't think that was Tesla. I don't think that was the case with Tesla. I, I was reading about them a little earlier, and it seemed like they started back in the early 2000s, and they had two or three rounds of venture capital funding before the government ended up lending them money. Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, all those rounds of funding, you know, they were they were like I hate to call it small money, but it was like thirty, forty million dollars kind of thing was what the private capital you know was putting in. Yeah. And then the government comes along with you know literally ten times that much money. So it probably gave him a huge boost, but at the same time, you know, he was doing fine, it seemed like, with private capital, and it just, the government's money was an easy way to get a ton of money at a low interest rate. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say no to $500 million, right? Right, yeah, especially, like I said, <laughs> at a subsidized interest rate, too. Yeah. Well, um, so our next topic is um, pre-planned war. Now, this is an older video, but I think it's really appropriate on the eve of what, you know, perhaps tomorrow, as early as tomorrow, they're going to start um, hitting Syria, right? That's what I heard. They're all ready to go on Thursday, right? Yeah, and tomorrow is Thursday. So I've been seeing the news stories, and it kind of seems like they're trying to warm people up to the idea, you know, like, yeah. oh, we, we could be ready as early as Thursday, you know, so people then, when it happens, they're like, oh, well, there it is. You know, it's not like out of the blue kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it's like they're floating the trial balloon to see how people are going to react, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, see if the people get out there and start, you know, protesting against it or whatever. Yeah. So in this anyway, video, yeah, 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 this video, Wesley Clark, who's a former general, he says that after uh, September 11th, he was called into an office in the Pentagon. This was after he'd retired. And that uh, somebody said that they had a plan to invade seven countries in five years. Mm-hmm. And you know Syria's on the list, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, they're on the list, and you know I heard Somalia, I think. Yeah, Sudan, and the end game is Iran, and even Wesley Clark. I mean, he ran. He was a general. He ran for president. Even he says it's all about oil. Right. Yeah, I mean, he made a good point in the video that you know you don't see us going to war in places in Africa, and that's because there is no oil. So he says, you know, you're in the Middle East, and nobody wants us there. You know, and in Africa, everybody wants us there. You know, they're all crying out, come help us kind of thing. Yeah. But no, we're not in Africa and we're spending all kinds of time and money and, you know, and effort in the Middle East. So, it's, I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to refute that. I mean, even Paul Wolfowitz, I mean, everybody remembers him famously saying the Iraq war was going to pay for itself once we got a hold of Iraq's oil. <laughs> so much for that, right? I mean, that's yeah. just, that became so incredibly expensive and it just... Just so spiraled out of um, out of control. I saw a a short documentary recently about how they were training um, police officers in Afghanistan, and these guys were like doing drugs all day. They didn't care about their job, and it was just the trainees. Yeah, and they, and they were being trained by real cops too. I mean, the yeah. real cops were no good either. And these guys. Um, it was basically just a, a really just a cover. It was just a, like an, a putting an official paint job on tr- the whole tribal thing they already had going on. And so in this documentary, they uh, showed where the cops grabbed some guys for some kind of tribal dispute and basically put them into this, to the, bricked them into this little space in the police station and didn't give them food or water for days in, the, in this heat, you know. And no charges against them. They were just holding them to hand them over to this tribal chief. Wow. And, uh, and this was right in front of U.S. troops who were there to train them. And the troops were like, uh, and, and, you know, th- this for even like any neocons who may be listening who are like, you know, we got to send those troops in and we got we to gotta make sure they're doing what's right and all that. But in this documentary even showed that the troops weren't, wouldn't do anything about it. Like they they were there, they had the superior organization, the superior firepower, but even when they discovered what was going on, they were like, "We can't do anything about it." You know, they can't, or they just wouldn't. Well, those were their orders to to not interfere. I mean, they they could have done whatever they wanted because they had superior organization, superior firepower. You know. Yeah. I mean, all the Afghani's were on drugs. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I'm cu- I'm curious what you think about this video though with Wesley Clark because I had I watched that you know and he says oh we're planning to go you know to follow through with these wars and it seems like a lot of them didn't really come to fruition within the five years that he talks about in there 
So, I mean, I had a hard time believing that the government is sitting there thinking, all right, you know, who are we going to bomb next? Let's go blow stuff up. You know, like it wouldn't surprise me that they've got some long term plan like we want to control this region kind of thing because there's lots of oil there and we think that's in our interest. And let's draw up these plans, you know, for what we can do. But I found it kind of hard to believe that, you know, somebody the, the way the story came out and the way he tells it is kind of like there's these evil people in the Pentagon and they're looking to just blow people up, you know. So I, I was just curious what you thought about that. So you don't, you know, you don't buy it, huh? You don't think it, it was I, for real? I'm, no, I think I suspect there probably is people there and they're planning wars and kind of stuff. I mean, you even heard, you know, Chuck Hagel this week talking about it, you know, and they said he's going around telling everybody, all right, we're ready to go into Syria. You know, mm. maybe we do, maybe we don't. And I shouldn't say we, but, you know, maybe maybe the government goes in there, maybe they don't. But either way, the military's got to be ready to do it, right? Hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, it wouldn't surprise me that the Pentagon is sitting there thinking, OK, if we're if we're going to invade Syria, where do we need to put our troops and what do we need to do kind of thing? So from that perspective, it didn't seem quite as nefarious as the video kind of makes it out to be. I, you know, it's, I think there are even invasion plans for Canada, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think that came out. I think that's factual. Um, what is that movie? Canadian bacon that that was in? <laughs> I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. But, uh, but I, it, this, I, this wouldn't surprise me if it were true. Uh, you know, it may just be a politician who was hyping things up in the middle of a campaign to try and appear like the, the anti-war candidate. Um, that the left, uh, you know, so, you know, it's, it's like they, you know, it's like a girl with a guy, like he, like he, you know, the anti-war candidate is the nice guy, you know, but the girls, <laughs> they want the bad guy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like the, but re- I, the reason I bring it up is I saw some article, I saw somebody posted something about how one of the, um, one of the cables that Bradley Manning, or I should say Chelsea Manning now supposedly leaked is something from somebody in Syria that was basically talking about, here's the things we can do to destabilize the Assad regime. Hmm. You know, and it's not, let's go in and blow him up. It was, you know, we can, this guy's really arrogant, and we can kind of use that against him because he only relies on four or five really trusted advisors, and, like, we can use this insul- insularity against him kind of thing. So just, you know, this Wesley Clark thing, it, it struck me more as that kind of thing. You know, like, hey, like, we don't like, we don't like Assad, what can we do, you know, what, to work against him? And war is one of those plans. Like a hypothetical so like plan, kind of a yeah. thing. Like a hypothetical, I don't know, I think yeah. it's pretty real, you know, because um, oil is so important. And I, I think that, you know, it is most likely a finite resource. And so, you know, as um, demand increases... And as, you know, it starts, oil fields start to mature and stop producing so much, it's just going to become increasingly valuable, especially when, uh, you know, the U.S. government has resisted for so long uh, implementing, you know, other alternative fuel technologies. You know, I mean, the U.S. military, uh, even in that video, he says, you know, well, we have this great military and, uh, you know, the U.S. loves its military and it runs on oil. Right. So, so frankly, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me at all that that you know somebody, somebody, I don't know who, but somebody's cooking up plans to invade a whole host of countries. Because yeah, well, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind somebody's drawing up plans to invade them. I, I'm, I'm saying I don't think it was quite as nefarious as we're going to go do this, you know, yeah. for the sake of doing it. Mm. So, like I said, I, I'm, I fully believe, you know, the Pentagon, like you said, probably even has plans to invade Canada to go after the oil sands up there. In the worst case. <laughs> As soon as that becomes profitable, you know, I, I, my understanding is that it's it's very expensive to you know extract the oil from there. But as soon right. as it becomes profitable, you look for a war in Canada. Mark my words. Well, <laughs> you know, in the Canadian bacon, I mean, that stuff is really good, isn't it? <laughs> well, so far they're so far they're willing to give it to us for you know at market prices. So. <laughs> yeah, at fair market value. Yeah. All right. So um, our our third topic is the Ron Paul channel. Have you heard about it, John? I have. And what do you think about it? Uh, I don't know anything about it other than hearing about it. <laughs> I mean, the guy's charging, what, $10 a month, I think, for it. So I kind of yeah. lost interest as soon as he said he was charging money for it. Oh, really? Yeah. It seems, it seems like kind of a, you know, I, don't, I hate to be a Ron Paul hater or at least a Ron Paul channel hater, but it seems like a bad way to spread the message by charging money for it. Hmm. You know, I mean, libertarians got it. Libertarianism has enough of a trouble getting a foothold in people's minds. If you're going to make them pay money to 
to bring him in too. That seems like it seems wrong headed to me. Yeah, I, uh, I for some somehow I, I'm on his list, and early on he sent out a little teaser with a video of him all by himself in this huge, like fake looking plasticky studio with spray on tan. He looked, yeah. his face was orange. And I thought, oh my God, what, how is this happening? You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of him, but I respect him a lot. Yeah. And then I, they did this little promo thing that actually got put on YouTube with him giving a tour of his studio. And, okay. it, and in the tour, there's the camera person is so careless that they show that Ron, un, you know, underneath his suit jacket and his tie <laughs> is wearing jeans. <laughs> and it's hey, like, he's a regular guy like you and me. <laughs> I was like, oh, how incompetent! You know, who has he got working on this that it's so that they're so incompetent? You know, it's like one of those low budget films where like you see the boom mic come down into the top of the can- top of the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure in one of these episodes the boom mic is going to come down and like hit him in the nose or something. <laughs> but and also like they have him playing newscaster. You know, I I don't know. I've seen a couple of the videos, and he's on there like. And next up, we're going to talk about it. And that's not Ron Paul. Like you can tell, he's an old man now. He's almost <laughs> eighty, and that that like you can tell his interest, you know, waxes and wanes. You know, <laughs> he's listening to people, <laughs> uh, and you can tell that he's reading off a teleprompter because his eyes aren't quite in the right place. Right. And, you know, like, for me, that'd be fine, you know, if I'm making all those scripts, because I'm nobody. But Ron Paul, he deserves better than that, don't you think? He strikes me as not a not a good speaker kind of off the cuff. I mean, he seems like a genuinely smart guy. He seems like he knows what he's talking about. But, like, in the debates and stuff, he always just seemed like, you know, just to, you know, have points to come up with right off the top of his head. That just didn't seem like that was really his forte. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm sure he gives a great speech, and I'm sure he'd probably write his own speech. Like I said, he seems like a really intelligent guy, and he seems, you know, good to be around kind of thing. But it just doesn't strike me as somebody that would be real good in one of those kind of live, you know, kind of roles. Yeah, I agree. I agree. He did some videos when he was in, in Congress where he would sit in his office, and his office was kind of dark. Maybe it was wood paneled or something, and he had a big, nice, comfy chair, if I remember correctly. And uh, and I don't know what the deal was. There. Come into Grandpa's office. I'm going to tell you a story, kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's Ron Paul. Those turned out really well. Those were those look good. Those suited his personality. Yeah. But him being like you know Joe newscaster, given the weather and stuff, that's not <laughs> Ron Paul. You know. I yeah. Mean, I don't know who he has working for him that's making these terrible decisions. Yeah, he seem, he seems like he'd be better off just going around giving speeches and stuff. It seems like people want to meet him, you know. He'd yeah. probably have no no problem drawing crowds. Yeah. And then uh so so all these people are like, ten dollars, how could it be? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you know, hey, I, you know, if he wants to charge ten bucks, you know, that's cool. You know, he'll find his audience and yeah. he'll make some money and maybe he'll do something with it. And and there was one podcast actually that I, I don't you know I have to I don't want to start a podcast war but but I don't like Uh-oh. it I'm not going to mention them I don't like it at all I was going to say I don't know what you're, I don't know these people that you're talking about like, <laughs> yeah, just like if you're going to send hate mail to, to us send it. it all to George <laughs> send all the hate mail to George and they're like uh, you know if if you if you you know they're like you your liberty stuff should all be done in your spare time. And, you know, you should stay up until 3 a.m. to do it uh, if you really believe in it, if you're a real libertarian. And you should probably keep a day job and not try to make money off of what you do, you know, for your liberty cause or whatever. And I was like, you know, I, I, th- I, thought, I thought that was ridiculous. You know, how yeah. is somebody going to keep a job or a business and then stay up until 3 a.m. producing quality liberty media? You know? Yeah, it's, it seems to me if you can make money doing liberty oriented stuff so that you can spend the bulk of your time doing liberty oriented stuff, that's what you ought to be doing. Yeah, I mean, we need, and that's what agorism is about. We need more people engaging in commerce in the community, selling and buying and, you know, making, the, making those Bitcoins move. Yeah, if people are willing to pay for it, then don't stop them. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like I said, the Ron Paul thing, like like I said, my, my deal is, you know, if it's $10 a month, I, I don't have $10 a month to spend on that. There's all kinds of liberty-related information online. I mean, if, if it was out there for free, I'd be watching it all the time probably. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I like to read more than I like to watch videos, but it just strikes me as he's going to find an audience that's willing to pay, and that's kind of going to be the limit of his message or at least the limit of his audience. I don't see it really, unless people are willing to record it and then repost it like they do with pretty much everything else. <laughs> it's not going to get a wide audience, I don't think. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good point. Yeah, I'm not sure if his, his content is really well suited to people paying for it. But there actually is, I read an article, somebody already uh, grabbed one of his videos and put it on YouTube. <laughs> so did he, did he bring the hammer down on him? Uh, not that I know of, but there was definitely butthurt from people who believe in intellectual property, saying yeah. that you should throw the book at them. Yeah, like I, I actually stumbled across an article where some guy was complaining all about the Ron Paul channel and stuff. And I guess there's all kinds of terms of service associated with the website, I guess, that goes along with this thing. Uh huh. And it was all kinds of stuff like you can't sell stuff on here and like you can't post anything like defamatory about people. And the guy was like, how are you going to be an advocate of the free market and then tell people not to use your site to, you know, hawk their wares? <laughs> but he did, he went on and on about all the little terms of service things that he hated about the this guy about Ron Paul's site. Yeah, and they so. probably probably just copy and pasted it from somewhere without even thinking about it. Probably, but I think the guy's point was more that like, you know, if you're this libertarian person like what's with the deal with all of these crazy rules and, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I mean I think that you know liberty our liberty websites we should strive to you know to make them places of, of open commerce and you know not restrict it too heavily. Yeah. I don't know. I mean I, I kind of see his point if he's trying to keep you know the ruffians and stuff out but I don't know. It just I guess the terms of service just read like this huge legal document just kind of put this guy off right from the start. Yeah, those damned ruffians. <laughs> Okay, so, so hang up. Before we go on here, yes, you said butt hurt there, and so I noticed that um, on iTunes, like eighty percent of our podcasts are listed as explicit, <laughs> and I didn't think we were that bad. You know, it was like apparently the bar is really low, huh? <laughs> well, actually, I choose whether to label them as explicit or clean. Oh, okay, you do that. Okay, <laughs> and I so, thought that was like a crowd or a you know a crowdsource thing or whatever you want to call it. No, no. And and so I was like, you know, I don't know. I, I think I initially listed every episode. I was like, mark every episode as explicit because I okay. thought one of us might curse on here. Okay. Just to be safe, you know. But <laughs> right. then I realized, like, like you never curse. <laughs> uh, you're like a Boy Scout. And, <laughs> I, and, cur- I curse a lot when people aren't around. Don't worry. <laughs> And I, I only curse rarely, so so I started marking some of them, uh, you know, clean, and you know, hopefully we can keep keep the yeah. rest of it pretty clean. Yeah, you should see me when I find bugs in my software at work, man. Then I'm a sailor. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have a question. We actually got a flood of questions. If you can believe this, we so got- asking finally paid off. Yeah, yeah. You know, ask <laughs> and you shall receive, right? I guess. So we got a flood of questions, and we actually got two people who I'm extremely grateful to, um, Mark and uh, Tri- Triangle Tactical, who wrote reviews for us, and they both gave us five stars on iTunes. I saw that. That was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. That was really nice. So thanks, guys. Uh, that you know, and it's not it's not just an ego thing. Like, oh, we got good reviews on <laughs> iTunes. We're badasses, you know. No, it's not. It's not that. It's like that increases our rankings so that other people can find the podcast and you know engage in our conversation and hear about liberty. Yeah, I, I took it as a. I'm glad people like what we're doing, or you know, are happy listening to us. You know, I, like you said, we get a bla- get a kick out of doing this and we make ourselves laugh. But yeah, all you know. It's one thing for the two of us to get on here and laugh at each other, but you know the fact that other people enjoy it. I mean that that does something for me. Just you know makes me happier, I guess. But. Yeah, yeah. When I stumbled across that, I was like, wow, you know that's that's really cool. It yeah. made me feel good as well. So uh, I'm gonna play Roger from French Canada. I'm gonna play his question. Hey guys, this is Roger calling from French Canada. We've got listeners all around the world. Imagine that. 
Hey, I'm calling regarding the episode where George, you're, you're you're turning communist on us. You know, at the beginning of a show, you say you say radical libertarian. Don't turn that into communism. Uh, this is regarding the idea that um, you know you cannot have absentee property ownership, and if you take that out, uh, you essentially take out the concept of investment, right? When I when I put extra labor in something, more you know, I work on getting more than I need in the immediate, you know, uh, present, uh, that's because I'm expecting to save some of it so I can, you know, live off of it in the future. And uh, absentee ownership is a bit like that, right? I mean, you, you, you've you put in more than you need and you end up with a uh, factory or something that's going to produce, obviously, more that you expect to sell in the future. You don't have to be there to own it. You can have a manager that is hired, that is paid to manage it, and the idea that this manager or some of the workers, you know, would have a claim to take over the factory because you don't show up every day to work is um, is, is, is really a dangerous slippery slope. At that point, you know, can I have a house by the beach? Uh, can I have a cabin in the wood that I'm not at all the time? And if I'm not there, then who's allowed to be there when I'm not there? Anyway, George, you know, stay with us here. You know, don't don't go start, you know, a radical communist uh, podcast. And uh, we love listening to your show up here in Canada. All right. Thank you. Bye. And he is worried that I'm turning into a communist. So is this the part where you roll down the red flag with the hammer and <laughs> yeah. sickle behind you there on the yeah. wall? Dun, dun, dun. What's the Russian? <laughs> you start goose-stepping back oh, and forth. Oh, international, you know, right? <laughs> Come on. You, you can get up and start goose-stepping back and forth. Got to put my, my Mao hat on, you know. <laughs> Grow my Stalin mustache. <laughs> you had the big, thick one, not the little Hitler one. Yeah, yeah, the big, thick one, you know. And then get out right. my shoe and slam it on the desk. We will bury you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think, John? Do you think I'm turning into a communist? Uh, I don't think you're turning into a communist, but I think you definitely have some wacky ideas on economics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's... Um, I was all, you know, in high school, I did an interview today on uh, with Michael Shanklin, who has a YouTube channel that's really cool. And a uh, topic came up of how I was in high school the only conservative, I was a conservative then, in a Philadelphia inner city high school with all liberals. And so I always took like extreme points of view because I thought that it helped illuminate things. And so sometimes like the, like I say things, I experiment with ideas in my head and I say crazy things just to see <laughs> where it will take me. Right. Yeah. But frankly, I'm not a, you know, even if like some people are like, oh my God, he's a communist. Oh, he's a socialist. <laughs> you know, oh, Obama's a socialist. And it's like, well, socialists and communists, they don't bother me that much. You know, I'm not that worried about them. Because? Because I think that the dis- the thing that makes it bad is whether it's forced and i think that sure. communism and socialism can both happen on a voluntary scale on a right. voluntary basis just like capitalism if capitalism is forced bad if it's voluntary cool it's cool with me uh, right. same way with socialism and communism you know if if somebody wants to start a commune down the street more power to you. I mean, as long as you abide, you know, you don't, you're not like polluting my, 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 my land or, you know, stealing my vegetables or something, you know. Right. That's cool right. with so me. I, I think that, I think that's Roger's point. Maybe, maybe that didn't come out during the episode we talked about this, but I think that was kind of his point was that there's this idea that if you have more than you can use or you're going to need, then other people are legitimate in coming and taking it from you by force. I mean, that's that's kind of what I read into it or, you know, from our conversation. I ga- I'm guessing that's probably the way Roger understood it as well. Well, it's like he says, who's allowed to use my beach house when I'm not there, right? Right. And so if so, if he's not there, so he buys his beach house and he registers it with the property authority or whatever. And then he's not there. And, and I'm, I come along like, hey, I haven't, there's nobody been in this house for six months. I, I think I, I want to borrow it. I want to use it, you know? <laughs> Right. And so, uh, for for the from the capitalist point of view, uh, you know, Roger and you might be like, "You took that house by force. You broke the lock." And I might be like, "It was abandoned. I'm homesteading it, bro." 
<laughs> so I think that's one of the things we didn't get to is at what point does it become abandoned? Like I said, like we kind of talked about during that episode, you're not just going to walk away from it for a year and then never come back and look at it, right? Hmm. I mean, you're going to have gardeners there presumably making sure that the grass doesn't get too tall and have your brother-in-law or whoever come in, you know, go inside and make sure the windows aren't broken in. You know, make sure George hasn't stopped by to homestead your place while you're <laughs> working on the other side of the country. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's kind of the question is at what point does it become abandoned? You know, if you decide you're going to homestead it after six months and then the caretaker comes by and says, hey, get the hell out of here, then what happens? Well, I think I could either be like, sorry, bro, I'll move on to the, the abandoned one next door. <laughs> I'll go next door. <laughs> maybe their cage, maybe their caretaker's not as diligent. Yeah. Or I could be like, no, sorry. You know, you abandon it. I'm staying. And then, you know, the owner could take me to arbitration. And if if he, you know, so then the arbitrator could be like, okay, sorry, you abandoned it for too long. You didn't keep it up. You know, you didn't cut the lawn, et cetera. It really did look abandoned. Right. Or, or he could be like, no, nah, sorry, George. He really was taking care of it. He really did intend to come back. It wasn't that long. And, uh, you know, you're just uh, a hippie, uh, you know, moocher. <laughs> Get out of our community. <laughs> right. And I, th and I think that's what happened to this guy that you were talking about in Colorado with this judge who lived next door to these people who had this property that they never visited. Hmm. So that's what I was saying at the end of that episode. Like if those people had shown up every couple months and seen that this guy built a fence on there and said, hey, get out of here and hauled him into court, I think they probably would have won. Oh, yeah. I think so. I suspect this guy was on that land for a year or two, you know, with at least without these people knowing anything about it before he decided to try and actually take them to court. Yeah. Yeah. So Roger uh, brings up another issue. He says that without absentee ownership, there can be no investment. Um, and and I don't think – I don't agree with you, Roger. I, I, I just want to say, Roger, I really appreciate your question. Um, and you have, he has – Roger has another question that we're going to get to in another episode soon. But I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that it can just be reinvested or invested closer to home. So I guess we need to define investment. I mean, maybe we need Roger to call back and define what he means by investment. <laughs> you know, because in the question, at least he says, you know, hey, well, you, you can save your money up kind of thing. You know, and so I think what he's saying is in order to save your money, you have to sort of be an absentee owner of that money. Or gold bars, if you, you know, if it, if it works better as some kind of tangible asset, you know, if you want to save your gold bars, you've got to stuff them in the bank. In order to invest that money at some point, you know, maybe you can't invest one gold bar. You got to save up five or ten, kind of thing, mm -hmm. to make your investment worthwhile. So I think it's not that you can't invest. It's just if you've got to put your money in the bank, when does that money become abandoned, kind of thing? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. So I think well, it's more there can't be investment without savings, and there can't be savings without absentee ownership. I think you may have. I'm reading into this, and we like to butcher people's questions on this show. So. <laughs> Let me go get the butcher knife. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? Even under the government now, um, they there is a time period under which you know if you don't touch your account, if you don't move it, you know, or you know generate some kind of activity in a certain amount of time, uh, it can be considered inactive and seized. And sure. actually, I read a, a year or so or two ago about how in California they were like jumping the gun. In order to confiscate people's uh, lock boxes at the banks, I remember because seeing of the that. budget crisis. Yeah, right. So, yeah, I know. Th I know they try and make some kind of effort to return that to people, though. Like if you've got a name attached to that account, they'll try and find you and give you that money. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like California basically decided, hey, we need this money bad. Let's just take it now. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's all. I mean, there's websites devoted to that, even where you go put in your name or social security number, or whatever, and they'll be like, "Oh, you've got money squirreled away in, you know, the first national bank of Texas, you know, in some little podunk, you know, one horse town." <laughs> and that one horse is yours. <laughs> <laughs> it was bought with the money that you left in the bank. Yeah. And then, so, and then Roger also said, you know, um, that. You know, if you open a, he he mentioned something about opening a factory, and then, you know, you can't, you know, if you if you're not there at the factory every day, like it's 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 not fair for the managers and the workers or whatever, to be like, okay, boss is gone, it's our factory now, right? 
But I'm not so sure about that because I think that, you know, we're big on homesteading, libertarians. And, um, you know, are these workers, are they not homesteading at all? They're compensated for their time there. I mean, did, we kind of got into this during that episode, right? Did we? Yeah. I mean, we did a little bit. We can get into it again. <laughs> but, I mean, that was my argument, basically. They're compensated to be there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, perhaps. I, another thing is that, um, you know, I just think that, that in a stateless society, you know, because I think a lot of times the libertarian theory is like it just doesn't matter because I think practical circumstances will conspire to to reach a more equitable end in a stateless society. For example, I think that, um, you know, without all this government corporate collusion like we saw in the, in the Tesla story we talked about a few minutes ago, um, it's it's going to be a lot easier for the little guy to accumulate his savings um, and and to start a business, and it's going to be a lot harder for the big guy to um, to lock those guys out of business to make it hard for them to do business. And so yeah. I think you're just going to see a whole lot more worker owned um, companies, cooperatives, collectives, stuff like that. Yeah, and I absolutely agree with you on that point, but I don't think that. I think that that and the idea that the workers in this absent, you know, this guy's factory can just take over his factory are two separate things. I think you're absolutely right. You know, if, if these guys don't like, you know, Doug Robber Baron, you know, drive, <laughs> driving them hard at slave, at slave a- wages. Then A.K.A. They go, John Tyner. Yeah. <laughs> then they go next door and, you know, set up a new office because they're, you know, the barrier to entry is practically nil. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, I think that's the way you put this guy out of business. You don't, you know, steal his property. Presumably, he paid for the building that you're working in, kind of thing. There. You know, it'd be really fun if a if a, a communist, you know, a real communist or a traditional anarchist would give us a call um, and 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 chime in on this topic. You know, because I I read about how communists and traditional anarchists are against absentee ownership. And I have to say, I find that you know, I find the the their, their arguments interesting, but I I don't fully grasp them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll, I I don't know. I don't even know what you mean by traditional anarchist. I'm I'm new at this whole oh, really? libertarian thing. Yeah. Uh, so there there are the so there so according to so there there are other kinds of anarchists, right? There are communist anarchists. There are feminist anarchists. There are feminist anarchists. What? Yeah, uh-huh. Are these just women anarchists or like what's the deal? It's like you know, I don't know, it's some kind of radical <laughs> femi- feminist vision that gets wrapped okay. up in the anarchism. There's individualist anarchists, there's mutualist anarchists, there's anarchists without adjectives, and all all of those categories are are considered traditional anarchists. And by and those people say that only those anarchists are the real anarchists, you know. Um, and that us, well, I don't know. I kind of consider myself a mutualist, too. I'm kind of in the middle, I think. Yeah. But those of us who identify as um, libertarian anarchists, voluntarists, uh, let's see, Thoreauvian anarchists, anarcho capitalists, especially market anarchists, uh, we're not real anarchists, according to the traditional anarchists. <laughs> And so we have this big gap, like this big dividing thing in the anarchist community because uh, like they are they're, – they're like not so hip on the property and the market stuff. And right. we're, we're all hip on the property and market stuff. Right. So – Yeah, I don't know anything about those people I guess. <laughs> I, there's – on Reddit, uh, there's a subreddit for anarchism and it's interesting because uh, sometimes ANCAPs will post in there – and they'll they'll tag the thread uh, with ANCAP, <laughs> so that people know. Do they give them like a big red A or something? Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, no, I think it just is like ANCAP influence or something, or ANCAP subversion, something like that. To to let all the traditional Fake anarchists, anarchists, yeah, to let all the traditional anarchists know that this is the place to hate on on. <laughs> On us liber- libertarian anarchists, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of you know if if it wa- if it wasn't so sad, you know, that we couldn't work together, it, it would be really, really just so funny, and it, it is yeah. funny too. But it, it's we're sad. Gonna get, that we're, we're never going to get anywhere arguing about all this BS. <laughs> <laughs> you 
just need to go out onto the streets. <laughs> That's for another episode. Yeah. We're talking about armed revolution at some point. <laughs> All right. So on to our, our main topic, uh, which is uh, what's going on in Syria and um, generally the idea of, you know, war in a stateless society and how that would work. Would there be war in a stateless society? Or I guess what are we talking about? Are we talking about there's some stateless enclaves, but then there's states? So are like the states warring with non-state people? Like, hmm, this sounds like a great movie idea. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that, you know, you know, I think that uh, once we build ourselves up to a certain level, there's definitely going to be a, a really violent backlash from the state. And and we're going to see some kind of war. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, well, that, that's what I'm asking is like, how does that work? I mean, the idea is kind of when two states go to war, the states go to war, basically. Hmm. And if one state can defeat the other, then essentially they assume the authority of that losing state. Mm. You know, in a stateless society, like, if you go to war with my next door neighbor and you win, great, you move into his house. That doesn't affect me, mm. except for the fact that maybe you're going to come after me next. Mm. You know, but it doesn't, you know, the way wars work normally, you assume the state's authority and everybody goes, okay, they're in charge now. Mm. So, like, in a stateless society, you know, like I said, if the guy takes over your neighbor's house, that doesn't necessarily, you know, the guy, your neighbor has no authority over you. So to defeat your neighbor and take over his house doesn't automatically give that guy some authority over you. Hmm. But I don't think so that was kind of where I was going is would there even be a war in a stateless society? Like think, who I, would go to war with each other? I think that uh, things won't be so atomized <laughs> that it will be on a on a house by house situation. I think pe- people organize in communities and cities and, um, you know, nation, but city states, you know, I mean, they won't be states. But I think that they, you know, it's it makes sense to organize like a bur- big urban area, uh, you know, under kind of a uh, common legal framework. You sure, know? and I think you'll probably see that happen. Yeah, and I mean, so you that's might kind of the way it works now, even with you know individual states in the in the U.S. Hmm. And so you might see one uh, city state being like, "Hey, you know, you're you're taking all our jobs or something," or or it might, you know, I don't know. You know, like you might see one city state being run in a very capitalist and centralized way, even though it's still stateless. And then you might see another one run in a very decentralized, hippie, communist way. And and you might see one declare war on the other. I don't know. I, I don't think – so some people think the stateless society is a panacea. You know, people like – Stateless society, you know, everything's going to be good. It's going to be utopian. Everything's going to be great. But I don't think so. I think it'll just, um, I think things will still go wrong. It's just that people are going to have the tools and the freedom to fix the problem at the level at which it happens. Yeah, it kind of seems to me the biggest problem is that people think that there needs to be some central authority. So, like, like I said, it's, it's hard for me to envision what's going to happen. I mean, that's kind of the problem with all this is it's all just conjecture kind of thing. But, hmm. you know, if, if, you know, your city all uses arbitration service A because they're fair and, you know, that kind of thing. And the city next door comes in and takes them over by force. There's no reason you necessarily all of a sudden they become the monopolistic arbitrator in the area. Hmm. You know, it's. But for example, I could I could be a young, ambitious um, guy, you know, a rebel against the stateless order, a ruffian. Yeah, a ruffian. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I could uh, get a whole bunch of other ruffians together and be like, you know, we're taking this thing over, and you know, guns will be freely available, right? And so we can arm ourselves, and we can go find, you know, the. The uh, I don't know some some juicy target, and we'll be a little private mercenary army, and we'll go take it over and shoot them up. And what are you taking over? Uh, let's see. I think that in a stateless society, you would probably want to take over the defense agencies. Well, you're not going to take Excuse over me. all of them, right? Well, in a, in a given city uh, city state, how many could there be? Mm, of know, importance, I would, maybe I would maybe assume five? more than one. Yeah, probably. And uh, and then I would take over the, the the bigger media 
uh, and I, outlets. Oh yeah, you got to get the propaganda out. Right, right, right. I mean, I, but I would assume the, I would assume these five or however many defense agencies there are in this area have some kind of mutual agreement to defend each other against people like you. Hmm. Yeah, but what if what if it's been like a stateless society for fifty years and everybody's like, you know, it's it's like the nineteen fifties all over again, and the security guards are. Are armed, you know, only with the, uh, you know, little sticks and stuff. The Barney Fife. Yeah, Barney. He's got all... one bullet in his gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, and, and and maybe maybe I doesn't want... that imply doesn't that imply that the stateless society was a panacea then? I mean, I would assume that if these defense agencies are walking around with one bullet in their gun, then the problems have all gone away. Mm, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> And maybe I maybe I go for the banks, you know, that have the the big uh, gold reserves. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. I suppose, but what are you going to do with that? Uh cart out, cart off the gold, and take it somewhere else <laughs> and have a big party. You don't think the individuals who own that gold are going to come after you with their guns? Well, let me try. I got my. I'm young, dumb, and full of you know what, and you know I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think you're you're presenting a compelling argument of how the, how you're going to get away with this this scheme. I have to say I didn't see the conversation going in this direction. No, neither did I. I thought we were going to talk about Syria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I don't I and I, I I'm finding it very hard to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> and normally I would be doing that, and you'd be telling me all about how the stateless society is going to solve everybody's problems. <laughs> But but I do think, you know, just because, you know, let's say, um, you know, we have a scenario where the, the you know, the U.S., uh, the feds, federal government falls apart. And, you know, so you may have one part of, of the country that, you know, goes relatively stateless. And then you may have another part that, you know, turns almost fascist. And so the fascist part may want to come in and, and take things, take over that stateless part. Yeah, I I, I think... I think in that in that case, you're going to see probably the individual states will assert their own authority there. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a huge rush to try and to fill the role left behind by the federal government, assuming it collapses. Hmm. But I think before you saw anything go stateless, you would just see government return to much more local levels. Hmm. Yeah, but I, but I do think war is possible in a stateless society. I just think it would be more small scale and i think you know it would be more like uh you know like hemingway volunteering for the spanish civil war you know that yeah. kind of a thing yeah i it seems like i don't know like when i think war i think states on huge scales going you know fighting with each other it seems like you know war on the small scale like you're talking about is gang crime kind of thing hmm. so but, i mean maybe it's a maybe it's a gang war you know <laughs> You know the Spanish Civil War is, is an interesting case because the you know anarchists were involved in that, and for a time the anarchists um, you know really did uh, take over, and they were traditional anarchists, uh, all, you know big parts of Spain and, and big parts of the of industrial production. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read about it in a while, but I've read that you know Somalia Somalia is relatively stateless. Mm-hmm. And the last time I read anything about them, the article I was reading was saying they spend a fair amount of their time just fighting off the UN. Like yeah. the UN's trying to come in and install a government, and the people just spend a lot of their time just fighting that off. Yeah, yeah, and and they're trying to put a new government in there, and then right, and, yeah, and so yeah, like the UN's like, we need to bring stability to the region hmm. by fighting these people, and like, just leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw something about how they were sending out tax collectors. And the UN was yeah, the UN or this new government that they're trying to impose there. I was going to say the UN's collecting taxes to fund this nascent government, <laughs> and like it was ext- an extremely dangerous <laughs> occupation there. I would imagine so. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that's that's kind of my point. Is it seems like right now there's just a mindset among people that there needs to be this central authority, hmm. and if you can get rid of that, it would be very hard for somebody to come in and quote unquote take over. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the whole the whole concept of taking over, you know, it, that implies a central authority, really. Right, but it also implies that the people that you are claiming authority over recognize, you know, not only your authority, but that you can even have that authority. Hmm. You know, yeah. if people just said nobody gets to have that authority, and everybody just kind of understood that your you your only recourse is to you know is force basically. 
you know, you go door to door with guns and be like, I'm in charge here. <laughs> but mm. I imagine that's not going to go very well if there's not some central authority backing that. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of a circular, circular thought experiment. Hmm. So uh, according to NBC, like you were saying earlier, um, you know, the it says the U.S. could hit Syria with three days of missile strikes, perhaps beginning Thursday. Yeah, and they claim that they're not trying necessarily to topple Assad. Yeah, they just say like they're trying they to level s- the playing field or something. They just want to s- no, but he, this is worse. On NBC, it says they just want to send a message to Syrian. Pro- I mean, why don't they just send them an email? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever see that movie Team America World Police? Uh-uh. uh-uh. Oh, it's a, it was written by the South Park guys, but there's a, there's this bit in there, and we always joke about it at work, but it's, you know, the, the North Koreans have weapons or something, and Hans Blix comes in, you know, and he's going to look for the weapons everything, and everything, and they're like, well, what are you going to do if you find weapons? He's like, we'll be very angry with you, and we'll send a letter telling you how angry we are with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah. But it, yeah. Sounds, it sounds exactly like that. I mean, it seems like if they want to send the message, they've already done that, you know? Mm. I mean, Obama has the mainstream media at his beck and call. I mean, he can send yeah. a message and Assad will watch it on his TV, right? Yeah. And I don't understand why chemical weapons is this big deal. You know, the estimates are that between eighty and 100,000 people have been killed over the last few years in the Civil War and that half of those are civilians. Wow. The number's that yeah. big? Yeah. And then Obama comes along and he's like, well, now they killed like 100 people with chemical weapons. That's too far. Yeah. You know, screw these other 100,000 people who've already died. Now we're going to get involved. Yeah, I mean, it's so, it so smells like Iraq all over again, you know? Yeah. Because the NBC says, officials tell NBC News they have intelligence intercepts tying the chemical attacks to Assad. Right. And then Joe Biden gets on and says, no, 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 it's definitely Assad that did it. And then NBC, you know, ha- says the State Department fed the growing drumbeat. So the growing drumbeat around the world for a military response to Syria's use. So what's this growing drumbeat and what kind of journalism is that? You know, like if I put that in a press release, they wouldn't publish it because there's no citation. There's no like X, Y, Z said and X, Y, Z said that. I mean, it's just like... It's imaginary. What what is this growing drumbeat? The, the NBC yeah. just fabricated that. Well, the drumbeat is NBC's article. Uh, there you go. There you go. They did this in 2003 where like the government would leak this thing to the Washington Post and then the government would turn around and cite the Washington Post as evidence of things going on. Mm. <laughs> and then and then so so that so the so you know Biden and Obama they can be like, "No, no, we just want to send a message." And then right on cue, McCain, you know, Republican, he says, no, 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 we should, uh, you know, go in there and arm, you know, it's like something out of Reagan's playbook, you know. It's like the same playbook over and over again. You know, weren't these the, people? Oh, weren't all these same people in office back when we when we armed Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan back in the eighties? Mm-hmm. I mean, like it wasn't that long ago. I mean, I'm 34 years old, and I know what happened then. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're a generation away from it and we, you know, everybody's forgotten that that's what happened. Yeah. And it's just the same thing over and over again. Yeah. I like, I don't, it's so frustrating. Like I, I listen to NPR a lot, like when I drive my car into work mm-hmm. and they were talking about this thing in Syria and I had to turn it off. I got so angry. <laughs> it's just, I, was, uh, I don't even know where to start. It just seems like, here we go again. And like, you can even tell people, here we go again. And it just bounces right off of them. They're like, we yeah. got to do something. It just yeah. seems like no good, no good is going to come of U.S. involvement here. I mean, I was reading something on Reason just today where they were saying, you know, if we help the rebels, you know, the rebels aren't – neither neither side is on our side kind of in this thing. Hmm. You know, no matter who wins isn't really going to be a friend of the United States. Which is like the same thing with Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, they try to build their <clears throat> own little, you know, puppets, and it's it's their their game plan everywhere. They try to build their own little guys who are going to do democracy and all the good stuff. And then, I mean, look at Castro. He was the U.S. U.S.'s you know little boy there for a while until he went off and did his own thing. I mean, that's the way people are. We all want to do our own thing, but. U.S. wants to have its little sock puppets in place and doing what it wants. 
but it never right. works out that way, you know? Yeah, it's it was, what's really funny to me about this whole thing is Iran and Syria are allies, and Iran is funneling weapons to Syria through Iraq. And the U.S. <laughs> is all pissed off at the Iraqis because they just spent 10 years there liberating them. <laughs> and now they're helping Iran, who's the, you know, Iran and Syria, who are the other two axes of evil. Mm. <laughs> What did we accomplish, or you know, what did the U.S. accomplish after ten years? Yeah, we got nothing. I just think that most people are in some kind of like zombified state where it seems too complex, or or they just don't know what to do, and so they're si- they they're silent, and it's taken as consent. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a there's definitely kind of a what could I possibly do, you know, yeah. to, to put a stop to this kind of feeling. Yeah. And what really upsets me are not the you know the neocons are out there like we got to do it, we got to you know those those guys don't upset me. They're predictable, but the people right. on the left who've been supporting right. Obama, voting for him all this time. Uh, under the pretense that he's a Nobel Peace Prize guy and he's, you know, the peace cannon and, you know, we, you know, he's change and hope and all that stuff. And then, you know, this comes along and it's like crickets. I don't see anybody. Right. I have friends still from Philadelphia who, um, you know, <clears throat> make all kinds of noise about liberal stuff, you know. But when it's time for war, it's, they say nothing. They're yeah, silent. I've, got, I've got a friend just like that. Yeah. And I asked her at one point, you know, they were, they spent a bunch of time talking about like there's a nuclear power plant about 30 miles from where I live. And they're like, how can we get this place shut down? And, you know, I just went to this meeting because I was just curious, like it was kind of a lefty kind of meeting. And I just went because I wanted to hear what people were talking about. And we left and I was like, what happened to the anti-war left? Like, why aren't these people? This was way back, like right after Obama took office. Mm-hmm. And I was like, where are these people like in Iraq and Afghanistan? Like, why aren't they trying to get that shut down? Like when Bush was in office, they were out on the streets. Now they're nowhere. Yeah. You know, it's still going on. It's the same war. I mean, I don't care if you got to be like, hey, it was started by the other guy. You know, you don't have to blame it on Obama even, but get out there. <laughs> you know, it's just it's so transparent. You know, like, I can't even take those people seriously anymore when they bring up their liberal causes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't know what to say about that. Well, yeah, I I don't know what to do. Like I said, it's the, the whole thing's very aggravating. I mean, I know I'm sitting here kind of smiling about it, and it would be funny if it wasn't so serious. But I, I don't know what else to say or do. You know, I, I think people really need their hands to be held. You know, because I I, I think that um, people just don't believe. There's no belief. There's no belief. There's no hope. There's no th- idea that you know I can have an impact. I can do stuff. And they need to have their hands held, you know, until they get to the point where, um, you know, they think that they can have an impact and they are willing to step out there and do something. Yeah, it it seems like the government's finally gotten its way and has lulled the people into believing they're not in control of their government anymore. Hmm. All right. Well, I think uh, do you you have any any closing words? Uh, I don't. I was going to mention to you that my son's school tried to um, schedule a home visit this week. All right. Yeah. I mentioned that to you. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to talk about that. So I tried to look up on the internet, like what the deal is with that. And it seems like a lot of schools are starting to do that. Like at least the ones I found, it seemed like it kind of started out as a, the home visit was for like low income families. Uh huh. And I wasn't sure if it was to make sure that like the living conditions were at some, you know, minimum standard or whatever the deal is. But yeah, like my, like I've mentioned before, my son goes to a private preschool you know, his teachers wanted to schedule a home visit. And I don't think there's anything nefarious going on. I don't mean to give anybody the impression that that I think that's going on. I just, I was kind of, insulted isn't probably the right word, but I feel like I don't need them to come in here and look over my shoulder and, mm. you know, make sure that my kid's doing okay. And beyond that, I assume that, you know, I don't know if it's the same in other states, but in California, um, when you're in that kind of position, you're what the state is called, you're, you're, you are what the state calls a mandatory reporter. So, like, if they find something they don't like, they have to report you to the state. Oh. You know, there. I mean, there's a certain list of things, and I don't remember what they are. My wife went through this. My wife and I went through this because we looked at um, doing foster care a while back. Mm-hmm. And they basically told us, you become a mandatory reporter. And so, like, you can take in this kid, but, like, if you go visit your family and your nieces and nephews are running around and you see something you don't like, you have to report that because of this position you've taken as a foster parent. 
So it's like you become a snitch. Right. And that was kind of that was my biggest problem with inviting these people in is even though they're they work for a private school, I'm sure that they're essentially agent acting as agents of the state when they act in their official capacity as teachers and I would never knowingly invite them into the house in that capacity. Yeah. Yeah, that that's scary. Um you know, I've been lucky so far here. My 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 um you know, I haven't really attracted any attention uh from the fact that my son is is of school age but he's not going to school. <laughs> Right. I mean, he's learning. He's learning. He's definitely learning. And uh, we argue about that daily. <laughs> but um, and, and occasionally the local government sends uh, around uh, somebody to check on vaccines. Oh, yeah. But I've heard you mention that before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I just I just don't open the door for them. I just pretend like I'm not here and they don't have the budget to to, to, <laughs> to follow break down up. your door. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't have the budget to follow up. Um, they 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 don't they they never come back, huh? And, and that's the nice thing about having an underfunded government is that um, you know in the U.S. they would just keep coming back and they would be sending letters and phone calls, but here um, no, yeah, no cent no central bank there to monetize the debt. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely, there is. Yeah, <laughs> oh, there is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Huh. The, the Bank of the Republic. <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, <laughs> with the horns and the big drapes coming off of them and everything, and the you know 18th century military leaders in their full battle dress, you know, nice. the, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, right. yeah. So <laughs> seems like a good place to wrap it up. Yeah. So that was our 20th episode. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I know I had a good time. We talked about Tesla, pre-planned war, the Ron Paul channel. We took one of your questions. Uh, thanks again, Roger. We talked about the pending Syria war as well as how war might work in a stateless society. If you like the art of liberty, if you think it's useful and want more people to be exposed to our conversation, then please help us out. We need your help. Go to our show page at aymfl.com slash taol and subscribe to us on iTunes, if you use iTunes. Uh, then leave us a review on iTunes. You know, let, um, you know, let us know what you think of the show. But most impor importantly, this will help more people find us and the message of liberty so that we can uh, you know, spread the message of liberty and, and help people. Hopefully. Even if you think it sucks, let us know. Yeah, yeah. Try, try and be constructive at least, but let us know if you think it sucks. <laughs> um, and ask us a question. Yeah, give us a call at 641-715-3900, extension 255-888, and record your question as a voicemail. Uh, your questions make the show more interesting. Uh, so thanks for listening. Have a wonderful day. Whatever you're doing out there, wherever you're driving to, and please be careful while you're driving, uh, <laughs> whoever you find yourself struggling with, we're rooting for you. So thanks, John, for the great show, and uh, I'll see you again next week. Awesome. All right, man. All right, bye.